everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining this MSDI research seminar, uh, the last of the year uh, and what a year it has been. Um, but one of the good things is that um, the seminar series actually was sort of forced to move online entirely. And that has um, actually, to some surprise, increased the number of participants in the seminar series, made a few very successful ones. And I, as I said before, uh, probably the timing of this one is slightly more um, challenging, but still pleased to see so many of you um, joining us today. And I'm also very pleased to introduce our speaker of today, uh, Joa uh, Porto de Albuquerque. I um, hope I pronounced that right. I keep struggling with that, Joa, so I apologize if that was not the best uh, pronunciation. Uh, Joa is working at the University of uh, Warwick, um, with which some of you might know, and the University of Monash also has a strategic alliance with and uh, at Warwick, uh, Joa is professor and um, director of the Institute of Global Sustainable Development. That's sort of the MSDI equivalent, if you like, um, at the University of Warwick, although with a slightly shorter history. I think you guys were established uh, about a year and a half ago, or two years ago. Um, Joa is also a fellow at the Alan Turing Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, and also co-directs the Warwick Institute for the Science of Cities. So those. You've got a couple of interesting labels, I think, for um, much of the work that um, some of us are in, involved in as well. And I guess uh, it's always uh, challenging to introduce uh, someone who has so many different kinds of backgrounds, but I think that's actually the thing that um, uh, characterizes you, Joe. You are truly interdisciplinary. Uh, you combine techniques and approaches and from various uh, disciplines, including geography, computer science, uh, geographical information systems, development studies, um, and so on and so forth. And, and next to being interdisciplinary, uh, your work is also truly transdisciplinary. You work a lot with communities and try to empower marginalized voices um, in decision-making processes using all those different kinds of um, capabilities that you uh, are able to, uh, to combine. Um, I got to know Joe a couple of years ago, I guess, uh, as part of the uh, Monash Warwick Alliance um, uh, exploratory project around the role of private actors in earth system governance. And uh, we continue to, to do another one, um, uh, which also involves Jane, who's on the line here, and a few others on the Chitwin River. Um, and we're currently exploring um, how we can collaborate that also in a follow up uh, project proposal. Um, more generally, um, I think your skills and capabilities are, are very much complementary to some other projects going on um, at MSDI and Monash more generally. Um, so I'm really keen and really happy, Joe, that you accepted the invi invitation to speak uh, in this um, seminar series. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that, Joe, and give the floor to yours. Wonderful. Many thanks. Yeah. So, can you hear me all right and 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 see the slides? Just a quick check. Okay. Yeah. Great. So yeah. So good day. Good evening, everyone. Many thanks, Rob, for this kind introduction. Um. And and many thanks uh, to uh, to all of you for being there. I realize it's not the optimal time. So you're, uh, we we said you're cooking dinner and 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 we are here in the breakfast. So it's one of the challenges with the with the with the time zone that we have to address. Uh, for for doing the um, the partnership between Monash and, and, and Warwick, but uh, notwithstanding, I, I do think it's a quite a, uh, exciting partnership uh, as well, or because of the complementarities now now extended to complementarities in time zones as well. Um, so yeah, so good evening, good evening, everyone. So I, I like would like to talk today about you know something I've been researching uh, since since quite some time. So as Rob as you introduced me, uh, um, I come from a background in computer science, have moved into digital geography, um, with with uh, looking at uh, geographic information and 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 methods for for using and producing geographic information has been a lot of my uh, research. And with a particular focus on cities and, um, and, and urban environments specifically. Indeed, as, as you introduced it, Rob, I, I, since uh, two years ago, I think I started the post of uh, director of this new Institute for Global Sustainable Development in Warwick, which has a, a much shorter history than MSDI, but also some 
common links. Actually, it was Dave Griggs who, also, who you know, who brought the idea to Warwick and initiated the um, the, the the institute movement or the movements to create the institute here. And he came from directly from Monash uh, at that time. So. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a really, really be, uh, big pleasure for me to, to be speaking to you today and, and many thanks for, for being there. I'll, I'll, you know, what I will talk today, I, I prepared the talk, I will try to be uh, very conversational and, and, uh, and try to uh, hopefully engage a little bit in the dialogue uh, in the end. So the talk will be, will be, you know, centered on this, on the role of data in transformations to sustainability. So I'm really looking at this and asking the question about uh, of whether this is bringing us towards inclusive and empowering resilience building, uh, in, you know, and, and, and particularly thinking about cities and urban resilience here. So the, the background for this talk is, is um, as, as you know, the use of, you know, which is also part of this talk, in fact, you know, is the use of digital technologies today. Um, also like, you know, from the background of COVID has been quite intensified, isn't it? So we are doing, we are using much more digital technologies. And this uh, has also shown some potential uh, of, of using this to be more resilient. For example, I can't I can fly to, uh, to Melbourne to deliver this lecture or the, uh, this talk to you, but, I, but we can still do it and we can still exchange. And in fact, we have been exchanging very lively uh, with the Monash team in, in the past few mon months, despite the challenge. At, and, and I think, you know, given the potential of, of digital technologies. And, and I've brought here the Sustainable Development Goals report because, you know, in looking at this impact of, of the digital uh, technologies in the SDGs, I think, it's interesting to see, of course, we have this big challenge now about, you know, the pandemic have, have, has a, a multifarious impact in, in a number of, of countries and, and threatening to reverse progress in important areas, um, but also, uh, uh, alongside this, an emphasis in, in, in re-emphasizing the digital revolution. So I, I was really interested to see in this uh, in the SDG reports that the UN really was pushing for the the, um, the pressing need for data innovations and for for the you know strong use of digital technologies because also the pandemic has shown that uh, digital technology has potential, but also that we have huge and important. Uh, problems to address in terms of data gaps. And that I think, you know, this two contexts is, is a bit of, of the background of my talk. So on the one hand, of course, we have digital revolution as a potential, you know, we've been speaking about that since quite some years. And I, when I, you know, started working in this field, I, I, I directed a master's in urban analytics. And that's uh, one of the programs that uh, I had here in Warwick, in our Warwick Institute for the Science of Cities, which is, you know, how can we harvest these new sources of data? So we have now sensors, we have now social media, we have now people, you know, producing data in, 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 um, in rates, which which is which are unprecedented really so we have data in a much more granular way uh, from the, a, a series of, of of data sources here so we, we have here in the picture some drones we have uh, you know uh, uh, um, low-cost sensors for example which are deployed uh, much more frequently and this triggered a new or, or idea of an what some colleagues, Mike Patty, my colleague from UCL, called the new science of cities, um, and and uh, or or the the field of urban analytics, really, and and you know, and particularly I am uh, particularly interested in this idea of citizen generated data, which is you know something which became possible. Everyone can now not only consume data but also generate. So the generation of data became not not only something that uh, uh, official agencies uh, can do in the government but also every one of us is doing in practice. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the, the new technologies and, and new algorithms to, ha to kind of like to leverage the potential of this data include uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning to process this data and make sense of this data. So there is this side of things, which is the side of you know, data being there. And there is the side which is actually, uh, which I like to, to use this map to show. You know, this is a map uh, which is actually a map of the OpenStreetMap. is a is a crowdsourced uh, mapping, and uh, it it actually interestingly shows areas in which we have more data and less data, and I think it's it's a it's a good picture to show and remind us about about the 
uh, the problems that we are talking about here. We are talking about also not only about uh, data uh, abundance and, and new data, but about lack of data as well at the same time. So with this, actually, I propose that, uh, you know, to start the talk today, that actually we should think about this as, as, a, as a, uh, what I've, I've been calling a genus faced challenge of urban data. You know, so we have uh, perhaps one more visible face and more emphasized in the first part, which is the information overload or, you know, the kind of like the big data side of things. So we have high volume data streams, uh, unstructured data, the difficulty to, to process that, but also what we've seen quite a lot is in it in social media today, variable credibility and quality of this, uh, of this information. So the problems of misinformation, uh, the problem of disinformation and hoaxes, and now with COVID again, uh, kicking in very strongly, the, the hoaxes and, and the problems with, with, with uh, credibility of this information. So this is what people usually call big data problem, isn't it? But what I'm proposing is that we have to see the other side of the coin, which is actually, you know, I'm using the um, Roman god Janus with the two faces. One perhaps in this, in this picture is particularly good because one of them is a little bit less visible. And I think the information death is the other side of this, this two-faced problem here. And actually it happens at the same time as information overload. And, and that's the curious thing. So you, we have both. We have information overload and we have information dearth because we have lack of spatial and temporal coverage. Like we've seen in the map, actually data is concentrated in some places, but there are others about which we know very little. And data is concentrated about some events, but there are many other times or many other situations about which we have much less data. So, and, 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 it, and in addition to that, if data is not integrated into decision-making processes and tools, also kind of like this data, it, it doesn't become an information. So it's still an information dearth despite of you know, existence of data. So there is a bit of a mismatch between needs and offers sometimes that causes what we can call this, you know, this, the, the, the twin problems or the, the problem of information dearth. So that's, that's what I would like to explore to you, with you today. And, and in particular, based on this, you know, two-faced two -face problem here, genus faced problem, the genus faced challenge, I would like to really explore with you the question I've been, you know, researching in a number of projects, which is really, how can we think about data, and in this case, specifically SDG data, so data for the sustainable development goals, as an opportunity also for empowerment and learning. So I'll bring a little bit about, of, 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 of ideas of, of, of research program that we have in Warwick related to this, um, and, and to discuss this question today. Uh, and, and I will do this really with, with and try to, to convey three key messages in this talk, really. First, first, I will talk about inequalities, and I will talk about inequalities as being one, perhaps one of the main challenges when we're looking at uh, SDG data innovations um, and, 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 the, and the use of data for, for de development. And then I will do a case study, one of, uh, take one of our projects, which is called Waterproofing Data, um, uh, which is about flooding and data for flooding in Brazil, and we'll just and we'll talk to you as an example of how to tackle of of these challenges, but also how we try to tackle these challenges, and then conclude with some some takeaways and directions for future uh, work. So, with this, so starting with with the first topic, really inequalities. I think this picture for me, it's it's uh, it's it's very telling. Not only because it comes from São Paulo, my home country, in my home country, Brazil, the city I lived and I know I know well, and a city which is highly, uh, which is characterized by a lot of stark inequalities, and um, they are social and spatial inequalities. And I think this picture shows here, in the, like side by side, you know, literally perhaps meters away very two very different realities you know uh, a, a luxurious uh, building uh, on the right hand side and on the left hand side uh, what we could call a slum or, or a very informal and poor neighborhood and and interestingly for me is when i started looking at this is that these inequalities in in cities and uh in, in society they are reflected in data and that's the first 
uh, take away. Interestingly, I have some uh, one map, the two maps. Up, you know, uh, as I've, I said, I, I disclosed I'm, I'm a geographer and I love maps. And of course, I brought I brought a couple of maps uh, today. And and two, I think are particularly interesting. This is the city of São Paulo. You know, you don't you don't have to understand the fully the geography of São Paulo, but you can look at monthly income distribution here, and you can uh, very quickly recognize that is a is a radial distribution, very concentrated in some neighborhoods, and with a lot of of uh, of poor neighborhoods in the in the in the peripheric areas of the city. And interestingly, we look at that the availability of data. Uh, with or one source of data, and I will use this as a proxy for data in general here. Um, I, we use uh, the use of digital channels for citizens to communicate with, with the um, uh, municipality, with the local government. And, and this are, is the, the map on the right hand side now, it's the use of digital channels. So you can see it's, it matches quite well, or actually, you know, it's strongly correlated. And in fact, it's, it's you know, it's statistically very strongly correlation, very strong correlation here between, you know, the use of digital means and monthly income. Well, well what does that mean? How much do we know about these areas in the periphery, about the peripheric areas? Probably not much. Uh, how much are they represented in the data? If we just take the data that come from the digital channels, you know, and there is a policy now in, in a lot of governance of doing digital by default, isn't it? Uh, so if we use digital by default, how much are we excluding from this city? So this is a big challenge, I think, for the data, so which I think is expressed here. Uh, inequalities in cities, inequalities in the society are reflected in data inequalities. So that, and if we just use the data, just tap into the data of social media and of other big data sources, we'll be actually reproducing and accentuating biases in the society. And I think that that is a key a key motivation for me to look at you know how data interacts with the SDGs. So we look at this, for example, and propose that these inequalities, we have to think about different types of inequalities. Uh, uh, you know, the spatial inequalities, which is what I was showing in the map there, but also some more intersecting inequalities for like like gender uh, and and and, uh, and and other types of inequalities which are not necessarily uh, distributed spatially. And and of course we have to think about their intersections. You know, between vertical, horizontal, and spatial inequalities here. But what I think is interesting here we did a, a you know a look at the sdg monitoring framework you know how that how do we know about uh, progress that we are making towards development challenges and and we have to think about that data are reflected here both in the target definitions um uh in the indicator parameters and the data. So actually we have to think about you know, inequalities in the different levels of how we think about development and how we measure and monitor development. And I think that's the key message here. So that inequalities uh, are structural and I think a, a big challenge for us to look at when we think about data innovations. Um, and, and of course, part of this is related to informal settlements. Uh, as, as you know, like that's what I already started to talk about. You know, this is the, the problems with uh, the unequal uh, urban urbanization is that we have a lot of urban areas or poor urban areas, so-called informal settlements, sometimes called slums as well, interchangeably or with, with different connotations, which the UN have that defines as, as places uh, which lack uh, improved uh, water, or, and sanitation uh, without sufficient living area, durable housing, secure tenure, or combinations of these different deprivation uh, deprivations. Um, so this is a key component and and, and the main uh, uh, goal of of SDG uh, 11. 11.1 target in particular, which is to end these slums and to, to promote urban inequality. So this is a challenge I've been looking quite closely with how actually, how this is reflected and how can this be supported in data in, 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 in different facets. So um, I just, just a, here a glance of some of the work we've been doing in the, the Institute for Global Sustainable Development. We have an ongoing portfolio of projects which are exactly addressing this context that I just described, uh, just uh, addressing the problems of urban uh, informality and, uh, and urban resilience and how to tackle this with data. So we're looking at this, you know, just to give you an, an idea of, of breadth of, of, uh, of things we are looking. We're looking at uh, uh, 
uh, about floods from floods in Brazil, which I will talk a little bit more in a minute, uh, to landslides in Colombia and Brazil, and to healthcare access in Bangladesh, Kenya, Pakistan, and Nigeria, together with colleagues on the, in, the, in the medical school, uh, looking at uh, uh, digital mapping as, as a means of connecting uh, maps of urban inf informal settlements in Ghana, Kenya, and Nigeria with automated and AI techniques for uh, remote sensing processing, and uh, very glad to include here also our ongoing collaboration with uh, with uh, MSDI uh, and the Chitterum River Program uh, and, and and MADA as well uh, in in the water and river pollution in in Indonesia, which we are uh, building upon a seed funding project and, and looking to to expand. So this program of research uh, it speaks to this you know, to this uh, central problem of looking at how, how can we uh, think of data in different ways? How can we look at data in different ways uh, to empower local communities uh, with data and then to allow a more kind of like uh, um, inclusive development and empowering uh, modes of resilience? And I would like to, to specifically talk today about the project that was too quick, about a, a project called Waterproofing Data as a, as a case study, uh, which we started um, uh, uh, two years ago, about two years ago. So we're going towards the third year. Uh, we, we called it Waterproofing Data provocatively, uh, to think about data and flooding and to think about making data waterproof or making data or, or or use data to try and make us waterproof or more what or water sensitive how how i think i, I loved it the word as well as used in monash um, so that that was the provocation so how how to use this data so we, we took this challenge really how to rethink flood data what is data about flooding how how is it produced how does it flow and we we thought we thought of losing this to to um to think about how this could really enable transformations to flood resilience. Um, and, and we are we are having in this uh, project here two case study cities uh, in Brazil, very different ones. So one is, uh, as you know, Brazil is a quite a big of, of a country. And we have one of the kind of like perhaps uh, one of the uh, largest cities in the world and, and certainly and, and, uh, the largest in Brazil, um, Sao Paulo with 12 million inhabitants. Um, and we took a, a very contrasting case of a city called Rio Branco, which probably you haven't heard of, is uh, in the Brazilian Amazon, actually, uh, in a state called Acre, and has a population of 320,000 inhabitants. Uh, so it's really literally very close to the, to the uh, border with Peru and Bolivia, and literally in the middle of the Amazon. And, and interestingly, both are very, uh, affected by the problems of flooding in different ways. So we thought this will be, will, could be a great case to look at, uh, at, at flooding uh, uh, in, in, in two contrasting cases. So the waterproofing data takes an approach which is really look at uh, uh, three different challenges here in terms of methodological challenges. One is how to make visible how different stakeholders engage with data today. And then we, we are looking at different methods for doing this. So a method called data diaries is one of them. Uh, we are engaging citizens to produce, circulate, and embed data. And we are using a, a couple of different methods I will talk a little bit more about, uh, which are digital flood memories, data-driven installations, and citizen science. And we are looking at integrate data uh, from citizens or citizen generated data with other sources to support policy decision making. So in this diagram, you can see that we are working in three different scales. So one of the approaches for us to think about data is to think about how data is used in the different scales here that are involved in the problem. Here in this case, in communities, local governments and centers of expertise. You know, I think there is usually in the, in the data world a, cent, a, a focus on the centers of expertise and on the centralized decision making for resilience. We look at this, but we would like really to see how this relates to the other levels and how much the data is flowing between these two levels. Looking at this contrast between some top-down narratives here on the, on the right-hand corner, between the big data of the centers of the expertise and the bottom-up narratives of citizens and their lived experiences with flooding and how to make them more visible. So this is the kind of like overarching uh, structure that we called to look at risk and resilience as co-production, uh, as you know, looking at co-production with stakeholders as a means for for looking together in this uh, uh, 
structure here. And, and there is an underlying approach here, which we draw from the critical pedagogy of, of Paulo Freire, who is a Brazilian educator, um, who became quite famous, I think, in the 70s uh, with a book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, and, and his pedagogy is very influential in Brazil, but it's also very uh, useful, I think, pedagogy to think about data not only as a as a means of as a epistemolo in an epistemological lens, but to think about data in a pedagogical lens or in a critical pedagogical lens. What Paulo Freire brings us, I think, is this uh, concern, is, is this um, sensitivity to look at the context. You know, uh, he started looking at literacy programs and how actually to make them closer to the oppressed, to the people who are really on the ground and, and saw a disconnect between uh, things that are brought in terms of education and the realities of the people. And I think uh, we see a disconnect between data uh, many times and the realities of the people. So we're taking this approach to say, we, we have to reframe data generation as also an opportunity to, 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 to of, of learning. And that that's includes uh, using this lens of a critical pedagogy of, of Freire. And we are looking at what we call the generative data. What is the data that really makes sense in the community and creates what Paul Freire would call a critical consciousness or creates a different reading of their territory. So th this includes really looking at the data generation, which is usually thought as, as a means to an end, but we, we take data generation very seriously. We perhaps, you know, uh, see data generation as as important as the data itself uh, because it's an opportunity for capacity building and learning. So how we are doing this in the waterproofing data? We are doing this using different methods. We are doing this, for example, including elderly people looking at flood, digital flood memories of how to make the, 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 uh, the stories uh, and, and the, the experiences uh, available in digital flood memories. We do kind of like uh, uh, methods of oral history uh, with, uh, to, to register this and uh, digital, digital flood memories. We do collaborative mapping to put, you know, literally some of these informal communities are completely off the map. So we, we work to really bring them uh, to, to, to create uh, uh, digital maps of those communities and then be able to represent them. And we do kind of like risk perception mapping, really, you know, work with, with participatory mapping to define areas uh, of hazards uh, together with the community. And this involves facilitating a process that really um, uh, looks at um, uh, how, uh, for example, make, make sure that uh, some of the perceptions of the community are translated into, into more formalized data. Uh, and, and, and last but not least, we use uh, citizen science and artistic installations, especially with youth, uh, uh, members and we are now developing a, a mobile app to go with this approach of, of with the schools so that they can be citizen scientists and also kind of like register data about flooding which which goes from registering even rainfall gauges uh, which you know might be uh, might, might be perhaps self-evident in some places, but you know, in some places having access to timely and, and very granular data about rainfall is not that easy if you think of brazil and the size of brazil that has more than 5000 cities and and a lot of, of 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 variability in the rainfall even data from uh, things like radar uh, they they aren't as granular as they could be and then that means that actually you know the, the methods developed for uh, are also biased towards areas for which we have more data so in a way bringing democratizing the production of even the meteorological data can be also very important. So with this sort of different methods, we are trying to really use, uh, uh, improve the database of flooding. You know, the database both for the systems themselves, but also for the um, authorities, or in this case, for the flood early warning system. And interestingly, I brought an example here of, of what I was talking about in terms of the approach of using data generation as an opportunity for learning. A very interesting quote, I think, that, uh, that we, we've heard in, in one of these exercises on, on risk perception mapping. Um, you know, someone from the community, from one of these informal communities uh, is called Mboi Mirin, which is, you know, in, in the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo and, and has about I think it's about uh, 300,000 inhabitants, only this kind of like district, 
of, of the huge city of Sao Paulo. So it could be a, a city itself. Um, and they say that, you know, doing this kind of mapping, doing this exercise uh, in this, in this uh, quote, they say, change the way they are seeing flooding. Oh, this was too fast. So I'll go there in a minute. So, and, and actually what I found interesting is that, you know, they said flooding for us was what we saw in the television. So they didn't connect their realities to, to the problem of flooding and to the problem of risk. So it was really interesting because when we, when we, we arrived there, they were like, oh, we don't have flooding. Uh, but, but then we knew that there was, there was flooding and there, there was a big problem there in, in, the, in the neighborhood. But then they said like, no, now I understand actually that we can do something about it. So it's not only about um, too much rain, it's about you know, factors of vulnerability that cause flood risk. Uh, and, and then now I see that flood here is a critical case. And then we didn't have this vision before. So I think that that is a, an example of using this data as, as, a, as a means of, of the changing consciousness. So with this, I will conclude with some takeaways now with this exam, example. Uh, so the first takeaway I think for us is to look at this kind of like citizen data generation as a, as a transdisciplinary problem space. And I think that that is what we're seeing here. We are looking at uh, flooding, both from a, a, not a environmental science point of view of, of producing data on rainfall, but also as a social science point of view. But more than this is, is a cross between this kind of like a sphere of, of the science and of SDG monitoring and of you know, official resilience building and community development. And I think you know, the, 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 the challenge here in, it lies in, in finding connection points between these different worlds and perhaps really defining new methods that at the same time get the data in the completeness, uh, timeliness, uh, consistency and scalability that we want, but also empowers, allows for multiple perspectives and enables social learning and conscientization, which is a word from Paul Freire, which is the you know, development of critical consciousness. So that's what we call the challenge of generative data. The other takeaway is that usually we think about data for transformation to sustainability, really emphasizing usage. You know, if you look at the report I started with from the SDG report this year, is really talking about data for monitoring SDGs, which is the use of the data to monitor SDGs. But I think we develop here an expanded uh, perspective that actually data can be used can uh, be used for transformations, not only in the usage of the data, or the usage can help transformations, but also the, the generation, as I just said, um, you know, can be an opportunity for transformation. As the circulation of data, which is the connection between the actors through data, these three can, can also be opportunities for data. So we have to think about the role of data a bit broader than usually is done, focusing only on the epistemological and decision making and the support for decision making. Uh, and, and my last slide, um, and some reflections really for the future of data production. And, and what we're talking about here. I think, I think uh, when you talk about data and SDGs, um, the challenge starts with the framing of the problem, really. You know, like it's, it's actually how, who defines which data will be collected and how data will be measured, who defines the issues is an important uh, topic before we just kind of like drop into collection of data. And I think we, we've, we've seen this quite a lot in our approach, which is you know, the need for connecting to local problems is also a need for uh, allowing for new methods that allow people to define the data they need, but at the same time, connect this data with other perspectives and other scales. I think that's, that is the twofold challenge we are talking about here, which needs for this necessitates transdisciplinary research methods. We need methods that connect these multiple disciplines and real world challenges really. And, and, and the, the other one is like, you know, there is a big, um, as I started, you know, there's a big push for smart cities and smart areas and smartness. But I do think that we have to really be careful in its smartness with spatial and social inequalities. So inequality is a big, is a big challenge to take seriously when talking about digitization and talk about uh, uh, smartness. And we need really to think about territorially sensitive digital transformations or digitization, which is really sensitive to the territory, to the society, uh, which is lives there. 
And, uh, and, and last, I think I, I try to convey this key message today in this talk, which is to show you uh, our perspectives is that data generation is an opportunity for social learning and, and empowerment of citizens. So, uh, but at the same time, we can do this whilst at the same time generating high quality data to inform pu public policy and SDG monitoring. I think that's the key kind of like challenge. So I've seen quite a lot of, of uh, initiatives that do community initiatives and community data even, but this data is not in a standard or in a, in a, in a, in a, in a format that is recognized by, by authorities. So it, it has a, a one component, which is the community development, but not the other, which is the, you know, the flow of data as evidence for decision making in other spheres. So I think the challenge is really how to combine both. And that's, that's the idea of the intersection here. Um, and that for this, we do need to think about co-production, co-production of, of methods of data products and, and co-design of, of, of innovative ways of really thinking of how to bring these digital technologies uh, to, to processes and to bear with, with local realities here. So this, this were my, my key messages, many thanks for in this late of the evening staying, staying on uh, with me. And uh, I'd, I'd like to stop here perhaps and, and, and uh, if, if, we, if we have time, Rob, uh, open up for, for some questions. Sure thing, uh, Joanne, thank you so much for um, hopefully not skipping your breakfast, but maybe um, having an early breakfast to, uh, to talk to us. Um, I think that was great. That was a very insightful uh, overview of all the different kinds of projects and, and honing in on a few specific ones with more detail. So thanks a lot for that for that um, talk. Um, I would like to open up the, the floor for any questions um, and comments and feel free just to, um, you know, to turn on your microphone and um, ask a question. It's a fairly small group, so we don't have to over manage that process. I've got a question. Yep, Claudia, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. That was a really fantastic presentation. Um, I actually also work um, in AI um, on the side um, in flood prevention in East Timor. And I'm really interested to ask how you include um, people with disabilities and vulnerable people um, within the community empowerment um, framework or model that you implement. Many thanks, Claudia. Uh, gr great to hear. I do. I do think that's that's a big challenge. You know how to be inclusive in the methods. You know, like I think that that's that's a big challenge. One thing that we do, you know, quite a lot, is is to think about the digital as a moment. You know, and then to think about digital and physical as a continuum. So you know, like I work quite a lot with maps, as you've seen some pictures. You know, we do print maps. You know, and then people annotate maps, and then we digitize. So this turns into data and to digital later, you know? So, and I do think that, you know, it's, it's too much to ask to think that we will develop, you know, only the kind of like um, latest uh, mobile app uh, with full fledged features that require the latest smartphone to use, you know, like that, that will be difficult. But, you know, in, in a lot of the informal communities I've been working, a lot of people have smartphones, you know, but not, not the latest generation one. So it's a matter of designing for this. So, you know, people with disabilities, we also had this, you know, like we, we had to, to think about some, you know, when, when, when coming to the field really, to, to be sensitive to how do you design specific methods to cater for the different parts of the, of, 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 of the group, of the, uh, the social groups who are in the territory. So I think that this is how we've been approaching. So really thinking about a variety of methods for a variety of groups, you know, like thinking about, for example, using paper maps for people who are less digitally literate. You're using kind of like, you know, um, different, um, that, you know, I, I think we didn't have, we, we do have a strong group in, in, in one project I'm doing in Brazil, uh, a, a strong group wor working with, uh, with sign uh, language for people who have disabilities, specifically, you know, uh, hearing disabilities. I think that this is another thing we've been using as well. And, and again, like there is a group specifically working at how can design technology to be more inclusive in that sense and include the Brazilian language of science as one of the kind of like multi-language uh, 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 components of the, of the research. So 
this is, you know, in short, try to perhaps think about different methods, you know, and different um, modes so that we can really be inclusive when, when working with communities. Great, thank you. Obrigada. Obrigado. <laughs> I would also like to ask a question if it's okay for me to go next. Um, also, thank you so much. I've, I've really, really enjoyed this presentation and I think it's really fascinating how you're bringing the, the different approaches together. Um, my own background, um, well, mostly during my PhD, was working around risk communication. And I found there's such big differences between, you know, how experts define risk and then how the public or uh, members of communities perceive risks. And I think it's fascinating, these processes of, you know, uh, participatory processes of generating data also raises these questions around definitions of, of risk and well-being and equality and all these different things, which, you know, once we have the data, it all looks so objective. But you know, how we actually create those definitions, there's so much in it. I think it's really, really fascinating. Um, my question is about something different though, um, but you mentioned, you know, that there is this, this lack of data, um, this huge gap basically. Um, and there's so many different types of technologies, digital technologies and different types of data that exists. Uh, what, what do you think is, is the most potential, um, like what data or what technology has the most potential for sustainable development? You know, like, for example, I heard people talk about that there's a lot of satellite data that is actually not being really used currently, but which could, you know, help us understand where deforestation and, and other problems happen. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just interested, like, what do you think will be interesting to focus on in terms of technology? Yeah, many thanks, uh, Celine. I, 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 you know, indeed, a lot of, of the this, this uh, different perspectives of risk and resilience is something I'm really very interested in, central in, in a lot of my projects indeed. And, and, and I, I feel like my experience is very similar to yours, you know, talking about what is risk in the community, it becomes very different. And, and thinking about what is data for risk, you know, in the community really makes things, make people think about, you know, what, what is data? You know, what is flooding data? No, like that, that was a lot of this question here, you know, flood data, is flood data only, only rainfall gauges? Is, is, is flood data only kind of like, you know, hazard maps, uh, official hazard maps? What, what is flood data, you know, is, is, is only hydrological, meteorological data, or is also data about, you know, how, how, uh, how many people have disabilities and that are affected by flooding, you know, or about the lived experiences on flooding. I think that, that is, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, starting with this because i think this indeed um is important to think about which technologies you know like which technologies can offer us which data you know i do think that for you know we we, we have a lot of in, in interesting new developments that uh, open up many different perspectives for us I, I think the remote sensing area you know satellite imagery is becoming much more granular much more accessible you know we have in the eu the sentinel data now we are exploring quite a lot in projects you know you you, you, you definitely will will see much more with satellite data you know and be able to talk much more about environmental fe features uh, as well of course there is even even the more kind of like extreme cases of satellite data with the planet and, and others, you know, optical imagery, which is really e even capturing not the environment, but capturing social activity with satellite data. So this is also became possible with the super granular, you know, meters, uh, some meters uh, resolution. That's also like definitely interesting. Of course, has also strong uh, um, question, raised strong questions around privacy and about how, how actually to make, to, to be careful about this. This is something I spoke less, less about today, but it's the other side of the data, which is, you know, the privacy issues and, and all the kind of like misuse and, and control through data and data surveillance, uh, which is also a very important question to think about here. But I think, you know, I, I am I'm looking at this complementarity between this kind of like more environmental data and the more social data. And I think in the social sphere, I think the citizen generated data is, is, the, is the thing that for me is, is the most attractive uh, new technology that opens up and democratizes data production, as I said. So I'm excited with this potential and challenge and also like with the dangers that it, it opens up in terms of, of really exposing people. But I do think that this is another technology that, you know, or a set of technologies, you know, all, all of them from social media to 
uh, apps uh, for citizen science, uh, up to maps, crowdsourced maps that everyone can use. All of these technologies around citizen generated data is, is another source. So I think, you know, th this, uh, I, would, I would say, you know, th these are some which I am particularly interested. I do think that data innovations in general is something we have to we'll, we'll have a strong focus on, you know, in, in the several senses. But these, these two are ones I, I'm, I'm mostly focusing on. Joe, can I ask a follow-up question uh, on that on citizen-generated data? I, 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 you mentioned in the beginning of your talk this sort of uh, what is called uh, information DOS, the uh, giant face challenges of data. And one of the challenges is around low integration into decision-making uh, processes. And that sort of triggered me uh, a thought. Um, some of the examples I've seen uh, back in the Netherlands around citizen-generated data, one around um, cycling generated data so people just downloading an app and um, generating uh, information about how to travel through cities and that was supposed to inform planning processes to make better um, urban infrastructures for, for riding in this case and another, another one um, where um, people could buy for fairly low price uh, a small device to monitor air quality and later on also a device to monitor or uh, to measure um, radiation for nuclear power plants um, both citizen generated process or citizen science project, but they, were, they had challenges in terms of not in terms of generating the data, but making becoming influential and actually changing some of the practices, um, you know, and actually changing some of the urban planning practices or in the case of the urban, um, in the case of the uh, radiation data, you know, uh, mainstream um, data organizations um, arguing that this stuff is, you know, it's not um, precise enough, it's not good enough for, for for us to make decisions on. So there's sort of legitimacy issues, I guess, around citizen-generated data. I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on that from the projects that you've done. Wonderful, Rob. Yeah, I, I think that's a central question indeed. You know, actually this question about uh, whether the data can be used as evidence, you know, whether the citizen generated data counts as evidence, you know, and who defines the standards for evidence, you know, is really very important. And I, I, I agree with you, my experience is very similar, you know, uh, so, like uh, there is some excitement about citizen generated data, but uh, there is also a big problem, which is, you know, usually uh, a lot of, you know, frequently, let's say, a lot of the official agencies see, see citizens generated data in a very instrumental way, which is, you know, okay, so I need this data, I will procure this data with the citizen and they will produce for me. So it's usually not the case. And, and also if you do it like that, you don't have the empowerment uh, and the kind of like the learning aspects actually. Um, but then if you have the empowerment and learning, you know, this data sometimes doesn't match. Sometimes it's, it's you know, it's, uh, the le legitimacy is questioned through technical quality, you know, or using the language of technical qualities. And, you know, the data mm. is not qualitative good. So, you know, that doesn't adhere to the standards that I am expected to see in the, in the data. We have the same problem with the flooding data, no? right? Uh, so if, if citizens produce this flooding data, how can this count as evidence? For, for example, for thinking about risk, for, for you know, for, for influencing uh, risk planning, urban planning, you know, and risk planning for influencing flood early warning, really, you know, how, how can this be counted as evidence, really? How can we, and I think I took this as a methodological challenge. And the way, the way I, I usually approach this is really to work with both groups from the onset in the project, really, if to work with planners and with the, you know, with the users in the, in the, in the government and work with the citizens as, at the same time. And it's not, it's not always easy, but it's about finding the intersection. You know, it's like, it's not, it's not, it's not everything that citizens are interested that will interest governments. And, and it's not every data that is, will be useful for the citizens themselves or for the communities themselves that will be used by the government. You know, but we can try and find the interfaces and the and the and the, the intersections, and and usually it is possible to find the intersections. You know, like in my projects, for example, the, inter the intersections are, you know, the flood warning, early warning agency. They are interested in rainfall gauges, really, because you know rainfall gauges are you know something they they can use, um, even if it's not perfect. 
we can design processes to say, okay, how can we make it regular? So we embed it in the school curriculum. We do training with the students and, and you know, and they kind of like helped shape this curriculum. You know, and then they have a bit more confidence in this data that will be generated. It will be checked later as well, you know, and that's that's to be seen. Uh, but, you know, they have more confidence in the processes of data production mm -hmm. as well. But at the mm -hmm. same time, we do this and we work with community to say, okay, we will gen you will generate this data, which is of interest to governance, but you can also generate data that is of interest for you, you know, for your employment, for your community. And I think that's the kind of like negotiation process we, we, use, we usually do. Thanks, uh, Joa. There's a question right there, and I see Andrea, you're also raising your, your finger. So, yeah. first, Darren, try to keep your, maybe oh, your sorry. questions. Sorry, Andrea, maybe try and keep your questions yeah. and answers fairly short. So, first, Darren, and then Andrea. Thanks, Rob. And thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Just um, quickly to let you know, we're working on a project here with colleagues at Monash in the context of a net zero precinct, which is in development, and we are actually looking more at I guess, how to democratize data governance um, and working with uh, various stakeholders in and around the precinct at Monash in, in the Clayton campus to understand how we could test the process for how uh, what we're calling precinct citizens could co-design, but also co-appraise various data governance prototypes. And given your focus on co-production in a lot of your work, that sort of brings up, in my mind at least, Eleanor Ostrom's work and I wanted to know if you've um, had much uh, thinking or practice to do with Ostrom's work, um, both understanding data perhaps as a common pool resource, but also from a governance point of view, how to look at you know, polycentric modes of governance and what that could look like in, in terms of um, these data communities. Thanks, Darren. That, that's that's re really very relevant. I'm, I'm, I'm more and more interested in this, in, you know, perhaps co-production has two at least two uh, senses here, isn't it? Like in, in the more the, the Ostrom tradition, like co-production of, of services as kind of like citizens and governments co-producing, you know, there is, you know, this, this big tradition. And I think, you know, we're talking about this as well, you know, uh, and we are talking about co-production perhaps in a specific way in research as well, which, you know, the co-production in the re in the research project, which is which comes to the kind of like to the more the participatory action research uh, and and citizen science ways. I think we are working in the intersection of both. I, I I do think both are very interesting, you know. And and the data governance angle is a very good one. I think data as commons uh, definitely. I I see them. I see data as commons uh, as well. Thank you, yeah. Andrea. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, your talk reminded me very much of a work uh, done by a very small NGO in Guatemala, and they're using an app called CoMap, um, which is generated more in Mexico, and it's uh, more in that area of Latin America. So I was wondering, how much do you uh, kind of collaborate with those uh, NGOs, but also that same um, CoMap organization works with Techo, which is an NGO that is also present in Brazil called Teto. So how much do you, does your your project or the project you're involved with, um, communicate with those people that are doing similar things that could help each other? I, I think, it, like the short answer is that we'd love to, to I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this grassroots data innovations, you know, and, and definitely, you know, super interested in connecting to them. I do think that uh, what perhaps we can help or how we can work together in research is really to think about processes that connect the grassroots with other levels as well you know I think that that is a challenge I've seen you know a lot of the grassroots data innovations they keep into the grass, grassroots levels really you know like they they are difficult to scale and diff, not, not only scale up but out really you know like really to to move uh, to, to different levels and I think um, specifically about uh, Techo and, and Teto so I'm really interested I'm starting to talk to, to them and work with them hopefully next year definitely so I think there are exciting uh, opportunities there to look at how we can connect these different, uh, you know, the different practices, grassroots practices, really, with this more digital technologies and thinking about data standards. Thanks, Odis. Thank you. Um, just we got perhaps time for one more question. I would like to ask something. Um, yeah, Eric, go ahead. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Professor John. Um, the presentation was fascinating and I was particularly interested because I'm also Brazilian, so I know Sao Paulo very well. And I'm doing my PhD, almost finishing, under Diego's supervision at Monash. And we are working in RISE, this very big project, but we are working, I am working particularly in a flood monitoring program that used WhatsApp. So people were sending me photos of gauges through WhatsApp. And it is really interesting and very similar to what you were describing. My question is kind of a follow-up from what Rob asked. Um, how do you deal with the legitimacy of the data in the academic context? Because in decision-making, you can bring both to the table. But I have some trouble even to justify the validity of my data in a PhD context in publications. So I wonder how do you deal with funding bodies, with governments and, and with academic colleagues? Um, how do you justify the value of a community perspective of water? Thanks, Eric. Uh, gr great, to, great to hear about your work and glad to catch up then at some point. So I, I do think that uh, this, is, this is a challenge that has been perhaps, you know, perhaps I've seen a trend of, of an opening you know, of, of the kind of like of the research processes, you know. Um, very recently, if you see like some of the large kind of like, you know, research funding bodies have emphasizing more and more transdisciplinary approaches, you know, and have emphasized more really kind of like co-production as, as, as trying to kind of like mainstream this a little bit more, you know, in the, especially in the sustainability uh, 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 area, I think in particular. But I do think there is a trend for, or there is a movement of trying to, to make this more systematic and more common indeed. But I, I do agree with you, there's still a challenge, uh, you know, especially if you think about, you know, I, I think that there will be differences in the different discipline disciplinary traditions, you know, if you think about the barriers of academia, really, the different disciplinary traditions will perhaps look at the data differently. I do have like very similar experiences that you are telling when, you know, I'm working in the waterproofing data with people who are really, you know, hardcore meteorologists. Uh, and, and, you know, and some of them really like, you know, have raise big eyebrows when, 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 like when, when we're talking about the seats and generated data and doing data with schools and, you know, using WhatsApp, it's something we are using as well. So similar methods that you use, you know, some of them in, initially are very skeptical. There are two ways of, of getting around that. One is first, you know, co-designing, as I said, so really bringing them in, you know, but of course you can't bring everyone, you know, like, you know, have to bring perhaps a sample and then have, hope that this will, will scale up. But one thing I usually do is to do, to put it to the test, really, you know, to do quality assessment, really, you know, like using their standards. Sometimes, you know, we do, we do, we, when we do design the project, we include a component, which is really, okay, so let's collect this data systematically. Let's have one area in which we are more data rich and we can compare the existing data, very granular with this one. And then we'll test and then we'll, we'll have like at least some evidence that these methods here work, you know. I think I've, I use this as embedded in the research component quite a lot, which is to say, you know, you define quality in specific ways, have, have, let's have a, a specific component to, to do quality assessment, really, you know, from your perspective, you know. There will be other perspectives on quality of data, but, you know, at least in, in, in a project, sometimes I try to accommodate it like that. So that's one of the strategies. Thank you very much, Joa. And um, I think we have to round it up here. People uh, might be wanting to start their evening and you might be wanting to start the rest of your day. Uh, but it was great having you having you in this seminar series and I'm really looking forward to um, uh, maybe even have you live in the future, uh, hopefully also in Melbourne. So we're working on that and um, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for joining us at this unusual hour. Have a good day. Cheers. Indeed. Thanks, everyone. It was really great. Thanks for the questions. Thanks, everyone. Look forward to the next steps.